enlarging your heart. Second Corinthians chapter six. Okay, Second Corinthians chapter six. And um, before we break in here, I want you to picture the scene very, very vividly. The bullets are zipping past either way. Uh, bombs are going off in every direction. Airplanes overhead, or maybe for more of a scenic uh, feel. Uh, crockery flying from side of the room to the side of the room. Voices are raised, and uh, doors are being slammed off hinges. What I'm really saying is, what we're about to read is conflict. And the Apostle Paul is in conflict with the church, even the church he planted, Corinth. And they don't like him, um, but the feeling isn't mutual, which is great. So we're going to read this, and this is Paul basically pouring out his heart here in 2 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 11. O Corinthians, he starts off, which whenever you read the Bible and the word O, it's always from the heart. It's a real deep sound of emotions that's being referred to here. So he says, O Corinthians, he speaks to them directly. We have spoken openly to you. Our heart is wide open. Or other translations may say, our heart is enlarged. Our heart is enlarged towards you. Verse 12 says, you are not restricted by us, but you are restricted by your own affections. Now in return for the same, I speak as to children. You also be open, or maybe you've got a King James Bible, that will say be enlarged. Uh, so Paul calls them to have enlarged hearts tonight. That's what we want to focus on this evening. So we'll pray for a second. And uh, we'll give our time to the Lord tonight. So, Father, we thank you for the privilege of having your word in our own understanding, in our own language, and to be able to not just read it, but to apply it into our lives. And we know that you have the words of eternal life, Jesus. And these words that we read are not just any other man's words. They're words of spirit and they're words of life. They're words that go into our spirit, man, and part the life of God inside of us. And we can leave this place this evening transformed because the power is in the Word of God. So we thank you for that tonight, Father God. And we just pray that you'll loose your Word now. Let it be glorified by people believing it. Let it be glorified by our obedience to it. And we pray now, Holy Spirit, breathe on all of our hearts. Breathe on all of our lives now to awaken us to who you are, to what you have to say to us personally and individually. That Lord, every heart tonight would know the voice of the Lord speaking to them in a special <coughs> way. So, Father, we pray now, just insulate us with the blood of Jesus all around. We take authority, as Andreas prayed, to bind everything contrary to the Spirit of God. And we bring it under the feet of Jesus. And we just loosen into this gathering the power of your cross and resurrection. And, Lord, if there's situations, and we don't know people tonight what they're bringing and carrying, we just want to speak the name of Jesus over each one of those situations and pray breakthrough over those things, the impossibilities would shift and we speak to the mountains and we command them to move now and be planted in the sea in the name of Jesus. So, Father, lead us off tonight, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So, as I say, there's a bit of a ding-dong happening between Paul and the Corinthians. And like any ding-dong, there's normally somebody that starts it. Well, two reasons for why they had this falling. One was that Paul had planted this wee church, and it was the Las Vegas. It was Las Vegas of the ancient world. In fact, to be a Corinthian was to be known for being promiscuous, sexually adventurous, going into every sort of filth possible. And the majority of the congregation, if you could imagine the Church of Corinth, was made up of transvestites, transsexuals, former LGBTQ members, uh, plus Pharisees, plus Greek philosophers. So you imagine what Sunday morning looked like as Paul set up that church. But what happened when he left was that basically the thing blew up. The thing blew up. They, they took into each other like nothing ordinary. There was a guy sleeping with his own uh, stepmom. They were drunk at the Lord's table. Some people denied that even Jesus rose from the dead. And Paul has to go in basically and write a letter and he just bangs heads together. And that's First Corinthians. And he gives a 10 point riot act to the Corinthians and he basically reads it to them and they don't like him very much for doing it. And um, For someone that's in pastoral ministry, I know what that's like. When you go to talk to someone who says, you're not living really what God has called you to live, you're living subpar. And they might cry a little bit and you know, they'll say, oh, I want to change and then you'll hear voices back saying, oh, I don't like him and all the rest. So it happens. 
So the ding dong was caused all right by Paul correcting them. But the other thing that had happened was that uh, Paul had a misunderstanding. He had said to them, I'm going to come to visit you soon. I wrote you a letter, but I'm coming to visit you soon. And you can read about this in the first chapter of 2 Corinthians. He got basically sidetracked. He got derailed. And he couldn't get to see them. And so what happened was the rumour mill started to spin in Corinth. And they started to say, Paul didn't keep his word to him. You couldn't trust that man as far as you throw him. In fact, I would even say, he's a pretty rubbish preacher. And I would dare even go as far to say he's a false apostle. And we need to watch out, Paul. And we need to turn to our preachers. These are really good preachers. And they just basically tore chunks out of Paul. They absolutely tore him into their shreds. And Paul has to write to them. In the midst of this ignorance that they have about him correcting them. And this misunderstanding. And he has to say to them this. You have to enlarge your hearts. You have to enlarge your hearts again. And so he's writing to them in these words, you know, O Corinthians, we have spoken openly to you. Our heart is open wide. He says, I don't hate you guys. My heart is very big. I have a big, big heart for you people. I love you very, very much. But he says in verse 12, he says, but your heart is restricted. Your heart is all shriveled up. Your, your heart has got very small and very tight. And, and you don't show love towards me. And, and he says, I've got a big heart. You've got a small heart. And, and he says, don't be blaming me for it. Because in verse 12, you know, they said, uh, you, you are not restricted by us. In other words, imagine how this sounds. I can't love Paul because he hurt our feelings. You ever meet Christians like that? Oh, I just couldn't go and apologize. I couldn't. They've hurt me too badly. This is what these people were talking like, like victims. Victimhood is the, is the capital sin of the world right now. And I want to say, if you want to be free from worldliness, you need to be free from a victimhood mentality. You're a powerful person in Jesus. You can make powerful decisions by God's grace. So make those decisions and don't let anybody take the decisions from you. Yeah. So we were hearing last weekend, the guy was sharing with us, 10% of your life is what people have done to you. 90% of your life is what you're going to do with it. So don't flip that over and say, oh, well, you know, what happened to me was this, and I had this, and this, and this, and I'm going to keep a very small wee heart, and I'm not going to have my heart hurt again. Paul said, I haven't shrunk your heart, you've done it. He says in verse 12. So what he says in 13 is this, now return for the same. I speak to children, enlarge your heart, make your heart open. Open your heart up, make your heart bigger with love. So, Enlarging our hearts, and that's what we want to focus on. We want to focus on this idea of having a big, big heart of love for God and for people. We want to have a big, big heart for folk, don't we? <laughs> yeah, we would. Yeah. <laughs> we want to have big, big hearts tonight. And yet, if I was honest with you tonight, the people mm -hmm. I meet, and maybe on my own heart, and maybe you as well, your heart isn't exactly chocker block full of stuff and you, you just don't feel as if your heart's massive maybe your heart's more like a like a prune or something it's all shriveled and horrible maybe. but i want to focus on this first we thought tonight why do christians who are called to love have small hearts why do christians have small hearts i would say it's three things tonight simply three things i've already mentioned one of them offense Offense. I mean, I talked to you about this last month. Jesus said in Matthew 24, he said, this is the mark of the end times, that offense will be very prolific. And because people are offended, even Christians, even you tonight can be offended. And what goes on in your mind is anytime you think about a person, all you can think about is what they did to you. All you can think about is what they said. And you're carrying this offense. And this is what Jesus warns us in Matthew 24. He says, because offense, offenses abound, the love of many will grow cold. You see, if you take offense into your life, it's like putting your heart into a vice. You know what I mean by vice? All, all the women know what I mean working in the kitchen. No, all the groups know what I mean. <laughs> you put it into a vice and you squeeze it in and it gets compacted, right? You see, if you take offense, you've just gone out to your heart. You've just done that. You've just crushed your heart and the capacity to love people and love God. So you have to forgive people not 10 years up the road. Forgive them now. Forgive them now as the opportunity is there. You know that you've forgiven someone, by the way, is that you can look at that person and all you feel is peace in your heart. If you look at that person and something jumps in you and you get all upset and you sort of growl at them, you haven't forgiven them. 
you haven't forgiven. And we can talk about that if you want at the end tonight. But the second reason is this. It's really to do with fear. It's fear. So the fear is this. That if I have want to love people, right? And I want to increase my heart of love. And I want to love people in a greater way. The best way I'm going to do it is illustrate it. Because I don't think the words will do justice to it. What's this? No, it's not. It's your heart. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> Man, that's, that's a balloon. <laughs> right? This is what you looked like before you came to Jesus. You were just a useless <laughs> Useless to God, useless to anybody else. You only live for yourself. What happened was you got born again. What happened when you got born again, and I'm hopefully not going to fall to the ground, crack a pop, is you got saved. That's what you call being born again. The love of God is shed abroad in your heart. I should have brought healing tonight. It would be an entertaining sermon, wouldn't it? <laughs> <laughs> it goes up, up, up. <laughs> um, but that's what happens when you get born again. And you, you have that little bit of love in your heart right there, right now. Okay, that's, that's brilliant. That's great. But you're hearing a message this evening that says you need to love people more. You need to love people more. And you need to increase this love, right? So watch this if I can do this. A bit more tension, isn't there? A bit more surface tension on it all. And if you're a person here tonight who has carried offense, and you have carried grievances, and you've been hurt in the past, maybe in churches or in your family or by friends, what your fear is this? I woke you up. <laughs> Don't worry, I've got five or six of them. <laughs> Preacher's tactics that never fails. <laughs> I always love the story in, in Scotland in the Reformation times when they try to bring in the Church, uh, the church of England, the, the Book of Common Prayer. The people hated the, the, the few stools that the preacher and he used to stand at the front. There was a case of this where he stood with two loaded pistols. <laughs> so I <laughs> that, that, that's my alternative. The rest of the time he turned the pages, that's all that's going like. But that's the fear, and that's not real. <coughs> What you fear tonight is because you've been hurt in the past, you're afraid of becoming vulnerable and, and increasing your love for people in case you're going to get pricked essentially by somebody and you're going to go blow up and you're going to give up on Jesus. And I meet these people all the time. They go to a church, they got hurt in that church, they now come to the church that maybe we're ministering in and this is what they'll say, I was in the music ministry but I don't do music now, I'm just going to take the back seat. And I used to be a deacon, but now I'm not going to be a deacon any longer. And I'm not going to do anything in this church because I got hurt the last time. And what they've settled for is a shrunken heart. So whenever you take offense, number one, you are compressing and you are suppressing love in your life. Don't be a victim. Don't be a victim. Make the powerful decision to forgive and increase the love of God in your heart. Second one is that. That because of fear of things blowing up in your life again and you've been hurt, um, but then you start to think, well, no, I, I, I can't love again. I can't love in this way. The third reason why Christians can't have enlarged hearts is because of a lack of maturity. And, and you see that there in verse 13. Paul says, I speak to you as children. I mean, Paul is full of sarcasm, isn't he? He says, you're kids. You're behaving like we kids. And this is what's really interesting. He's saying to them, the reason why you have such small, little shriveled up little hearts is because you're still immature. You're immature. So you take those three big hitters, why our hearts are small tonight. You've taken an offense. You're afraid of being hurt. Or there's an immaturity in your life. And let's look at this immaturity for a wee second. Go to 1 John. 1 John chapter 2. This is a really interesting um, scripture. <coughs> so, 1 John chapter 2, verses 12 to 13. The, these are a set of verses that describe Christian maturity. <coughs> there are three levels of Christian maturity tonight. And you're either in one, two, or three, right? You're in one of these three grades. So you can analyze this for yourself. First grade is this, little children, basically toddlers, newborns. 
And it describes these people in verse 12. I write to you, little children, because your sins are forgiven you for his name's sake. And if you go into the second part of verse 13, it says, I write to you, little children, because you've known the Father. So if you're newly born again, if you're an immature Christian, the two things that are really powerful in your life and really speak to you is all of your sins have been forgiven and you know that. You really know what it means to be saved. You've got all your sins forgiven, past, present, future, under the blood of Jesus, you're totally forgiven. And that's a wonderful experience. And you've come to know God as your heavenly father. That, that's the mark of a newbie Christian. So does that apply to anybody? Anybody feel that that is applicable to their lives? Okay, all of you need saved. <laughs> Have you been forgiven? And do you know that you're forgiven tonight? Yes. Okay. And, and are you starting to know God as your heavenly father? Yes. Yeah, that, that's what it means to be essentially born again. But let's go on to the next stage. And by the way, when I asked you to put up hands running, I'm not trying to trick you. Um, I'm not that nasty. But the second stage is basically teenagers. Uh, 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 John calls them young men. So he says this here in, in, verse, um, in verse 13. It says in the middle of it, it says, I write to you, young men, because you have overcome the wicked one. So you've overcome. That's the key word. You've overcome. And it goes on there in verse 14, at the latter part of it, it says, I've written to you, young men, because you are strong, and the word of God abides in you, and you've overcome the wicked one. <clears throat> so the teenage stage of our maturity looks like this. That you find yourself in a battle with the flesh, the world, and the devil. And you find yourself in this struggle all of the time. But what you've learned is to lean into the Holy Spirit and lean into the power of God. And you're starting to overcome. Sin that once held you doesn't hold you any longer. The temptations that used to draw you away don't do it now. And you've been in spiritual warfare and you've started to overcome Satan in your life. And the reason it says there in verse 14 is that you've grown strong in the Lord because you're abiding in his word. You've got deeper into the scripture and you've applied it in your life and you've used the word of God as a means of strength and you're overcoming. You're overcoming. So and don't be bashful that. Is that true of anybody tonight? Okay, that's good. That's excellent. You, you've, you've reached a certain level of maturity in your Christian journey. But let's look at the third stage, and this is what we're all going for tonight. We read about this in the fathers, or the mothers for that matter. It says this in verse 13 at the very start. I write to you fathers because you have known him who is from the beginning. In simple terms, they know Jesus. They really know Jesus. They know his presence. They know his voice. They know what it is to walk with him and to talk with him. They have this reservoir of a history of God. They've got this history with God, and they just say, God answers prayer. God has revealed himself. I know God. They just know Jesus from the beginning. And that's, I don't even feel like that. I feel I'm like a little teenager. Maybe, maybe hitting 21st soon, I don't know, but I still feel as if I'm a teenage Christian. But what is really interesting, you take these three categories of Christians. You've got the wee baby Christians, you've got the teenage Christians, and you've got the fathers or mothers, you know, mommy and daddy Christians and that. Here's a big question. And it's not a trick question, it's straightforward. How many people does a baby love? If you were to interview a baby, <laughs> how many people does that wee critter love? Everyone? Mommy and daddy. Yes. Probably mum rather than dad. Uh, mum feeds and that's dad, doesn't it? So the fact is this. The baby only really loves one person. And whenever you are born again, your love is very limited, and it's only limited to people that help you. So you love the evangelist that led you to Jesus. You love the pastor that welcomed you into the family of God. You welcome maybe the group leader of the Bible study that, that just really took you under his wing and just showed you compassion. But you didn't really like the old bit in the back row that gave off to you hand again about smoking in the front of the church or whatever, from the back of the church. Whatever. You didn't really like her too often. And, and you didn't like the wee guy, he got up preached one morning and he was all nasty and he was all telling you to do stuff. You didn't like him very much, but, but you loved people who loved you. You loved people that mothered you and smothered you and nurtured you. Is that true? Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, I think that is true. Yeah. Whether you agree or disagree, I think it's true. Talk to me about teenagers. Now, I know that's, who do they love? That's an awkward question, is it not? 
Tell me, what sort of people should, the trip, should a teenager love, for that example? Take your average 18 year old. Who do they love? Their mates. Their mates, yeah? Who should they love is maybe a better question. Because they can be grumpy as the rest of the time. They love their mum, they love their dad, they love maybe their siblings, they love their friends, they love, you know, boyfriend, girlfriend. In other words, their love has got larger. You see that? Their love has got larger, that they've got this ability to love more and more people. Go up again then. Take someone that's a father or a mother. How many people do they love? List some of the people that they might love. There's no wrong answer, by the way. There's strong mutism in the room. Their children. They love their children, of course. They, they love their parents, your mom and their dad, and they may love their in-laws, and they may love their friends, and they, and they may love so many more. And by the time maybe their fathers and mothers of several years, they have grandkids and all these other people, wider right, family, and their love is so big, so, so big. So when it begins, when you're first born again, your love is very, very limited. You only love people that help you. When you're a teenage Christian, you only love people that are like you on your wavelength. But when you are a father or a mother and reach that maturity of knowing Jesus personally, your love is for every person. You have a great big love. So I want to ask you that tonight, very simply. How many feel, quite honestly, that there's baby Christians? There's no shame in that. God's doing a work in all of our lives. Anybody just raise a hand, you feel, I just feel I'm a baby Christian, I'm limited. I'm limited. Okay. How many feel in the second category? You're loving people, but they're maybe more like you than, than uh, everybody you meet, let's say. Is that true of anybody? Okay. And how many feel that they've got into this real lovely, intimate place with Jesus where they know him in this wonderful way and there's just love for everybody in the room? That's good. That's good. This is what the Lord wants to do with all of us. He wants to take us from a limited, small little place of love into a huge, large place. That's his heart. So, what I want to do as we bring this all to a look and close, is to focus on how do you enlarge your heart. How do you enlarge your heart tonight? Mm -hmm. First things first. I want you to know it. It's impossible. It's downright impossible. You can't do it. Lovely to see you all tonight. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> it is impossible. It is utterly impossible to do this. So if anyone thinks tonight, well, you know, I was a loving person and then Jesus met me. And basically, Jesus said, you know, we've got a shortage of love in the kingdom. And we would just love if you could bring your love into the kingdom. Because, you know, there's not an awful lot of it here. I mean, we, we the past five years have been rough and that we Baptist, that we Elam, that we <laughs> Congregational Church. And thank God you came along because the love levels went to the roof. That didn't happen. That didn't happen. And I want us to turn to the passage in Luke, in Luke 14. Luke 14 here. This is one of Jesus' disciple passages when he, when he basically specifies and clarifies what it means to be a disciple, what it means to be a genuine Christian. Um, we have lowered the bar so low in Christianity that we just say, say the prayer and you're in. But Jesus says the signs of discipleship are the mark that you're in for the kingdom. And one of the marks is what we're going to read here. Verse 25, Jesus says in Luke 14, verse 25 reads this, Now great multitudes went with him, and he turned and he said to them, If anyone comes to me, which is saying, I want a relationship with Jesus, uh, I would like to follow Jesus, I'd like to become a Christian. So this is what Jesus says, if you want to be a Christian tonight, and you claim to be a Christian, this is what it looks like. If anyone comes to me and does not hate his father and his mother, wife and children, Brothers and sisters, yes, and his own life also, he cannot be my disciple. How's your hatred doing? How's that going? That's a bit of a troublesome verse, isn't it? Not? And verse 27 says, And who does not bear his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. Now, what that simply means, very, very basically, is that Jesus is saying, If you're to follow me, 
I have to be number one love of your life and your love for me far surpasses any other relationship or love interest that you may have. That your love for me is so strong that in comparison to your family or your loved one or your kids, that it looks like hatred. You know, he's not literally telling us, you know, beat your parents up or, you know, take a baseball bat to your kids or something. He's not doing some daft like that. But he's using this figurative language to say, look, the love of Christ is supreme. And that means if my family go against Christ, I'm going for Christ. If my wife goes against Christ, I'm going for Christ. If my friends go against Christ, I'm going for Christ. Christ is the final authority in my life. I'm following him. I'm taking the cross, even if it means suffering, I'm going to obey him no matter what. That's what he means. So if you are a true Christian tonight, the one who holds your heartstrings is not your loved ones, your friends or your family, it's Jesus alone. That's what it means to become a Christian. Jesus has the utmost say. Because I meet a lot, a lot of people and they say, I'm a follower of Jesus. And I think of this young generation in particular. And they're a bit panicking when they hit about 28, 29 and says, I'm not married. And then what happens going to the dating site and there's so and so, you know, Buddhist or whatever they are. And they oh, I'm going to get, oh, I'm desperate, I mean. And they're not obeying what Jesus said. If you love me primarily, that's what he says. So you see what I mean. Our affections need <coughs> surrender to the Lordship of Jesus. That's what he's bringing out. But what I want to say to you this evening is this. Do you realize what you signed yourself up to whenever you got saved? I mean, if I was to come to the meeting tonight and say to you, look, next week, we're going to be a big bus there in Bound Bridge. Anybody can join the bus, you're welcome to come on the bus. We're going to go on a road trip. Anybody want to come on the road trip? And everybody would rightly ask, well, where are you going to? Oh, we're just going to climb Mount Everest. We're just going to climb Mount Everest. It should just take us a weekend, like, I mean, we'll be back on Sunday night. Would you like to come? You say, ah, oh, that's impossible, you can't do that. Or if I was to come here and I say, look, I'm a NASA representative, we're going to go and colonize Mars. Anybody want to come next Saturday, we're going to go for a day trip or something. You know, and you can bring souvenirs back, <laughs> all, the, all the red rock you want, right? Everybody said, no, that's impossible. That's absolutely daft. Why would you be telling me to do that? But when you heard the gospel, when you heard the message to come to Jesus Christ, to trust him and to be a follower of this, this is what he tells you to do. You will love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. Love God perfectly every day of your life from now on. He says, love your neighbor as you would like to be loved. He says, love your Christian friends as I love you. And he says then, when your enemies come and persecute you and beat you up and give you a hard time, love them as well. It would have been safer for you not to get on the bus. That's why when, you know, for example, it should be headline news that so-and-so became a Christian. It is exciting and it is as thrilling as somebody might in Mount Everest or someone colonizing Mars for the first time. They have done something which is physically and humanly difficult and impossible to do. The world is looking, as Ren and Raven used to say, not for a new definition of Christianity. And boy, we can fly them out every week. We can say, we've started a new church and we do better coffee than the other place up the road. And uh, the, the jeans are extra skinny on our worship leaders. And, you know, I mean, uh, we've got the next definition of this thing all wrapped up nicely. Ren and Raven says the world is not looking for a new definition of Christianity. It's looking for a new demonstration of it. It's looking for people that take Jesus seriously and say, you know what, this Christianity malarkey is real and I'm going to treat it as real. That's what the world's looking for. But this is what I'm trying to bring to you. You see the call to love God with all your heart, so mind and strength, to love your neighbors, to love your fellow believers, to love the world, to love the enemies you have? Impossible. Impossible. Every one of you tonight have failed on that one. And every one of you will fail on that. And the man who tells you it is a failure at this as well. <clears throat> so it's wonderful to be in a house of failure tonight, isn't it? <laughs> All of you failed. Watchman Nee, when he commented on these verses where Jesus said, except you hate your father and your mother, except you hate your loved one, except you hate your own children, except you hate 
You know, watch my knee said. He said, it is not that Jesus is calling us to hate men, but what he's calling us to do is to give our inadequate natural love at the cross and receive and exchange a supernatural love, the love of God. I want to make it abundantly clear to you tonight. You cannot love God in your own flesh. And you cannot love people in your own strength. And you cannot love your enemies. You will not. You will hate the sight of them and you will spit at them and sue them for all they got. You will not be able to do it. But I can tell you about somebody that does love people. And that's Jesus. And Christianity is Christ living through a man or a woman that surrendered to him. That's who it is. There's only one person who can live the Christian life and it's Jesus Christ. Nobody else. I hear people say, oh, that's a lovely Christian man or such and such is a beautiful wee woman. She's a lovely Christian wee lady. The fact is, no. Even the sweetest wee grandma, loaded with Werther's originals, she can't love you. She can't do it. She can't do it. No amount of apple pie is going to make this thing good. There's none of us. None of us can love like this. Jesus can. He loved God with all of his heart, soul, mind and strength. Every day he chose to love God. He loved his disciples, it says, unto the end. Through thick and thin, through all their stupidity, all their ignorance, he loved them all the time. This same Jesus that looked on people that were as obnoxious as the rich young ruler. He says, I've kept the commandments since my youth. I'm basically a gift of the kingdom. And Jesus looking on him loved him and says. The same Jesus that when they put the nails through his hands and his feet, he was able to say, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they do. That's the love that Jesus wants to give us. And so what I want you to see tonight, you this evening are trying to love people. Now tell me this. Is anybody here honestly trying to love people, but you really find it hard to do that? Okay. What about converting that love from a very poor petrol engine to a turbocharged, whatever, rocket fuel thing, right? right? Let's take that inadequate love, bring it to Jesus and exchange it. I, I can think about an experience, I've talked to some of the folk here before, but it was with, to do with peace. And one time I was late to a gathering, at, so I had to go and I was racing and I hit a stand more roundabout just there in Dungannon. And I was in the head was in a spin and I just, oh, this is awful and everything's going wrong. And I remember the voice of the Lord speaking to me so clearly and says, Stephen, you're living in your peace instead of my peace. He said, my peace I give to you. A lot of us are trying to live out of our own self-righteousness, our own ability to keep the rules. Our own ability to keep the Bible. We can't do it. You can't do it. And that's the problem with half the Christians in the country. They'll keep the parts of the Bible that's easy to keep. So they'll stick hats on women's heads and dunk everybody and get everybody into membership. But to love one another and to rejoice always and pray without ceasing, they don't focus on that stuff. They just stick hats on women's heads and, you know, well, we're, we're biblical, brother. Yeah, you've kept the part your flesh can keep, but not the rest of it because it's impossible to keep. You need the Holy Spirit who, who releases Jesus' love through you. So this is what I proposed to us tonight. There's a cross that Jesus calls us to. He says, take up the cross. It means to die. What do you have to die to? I have to die to my own love. My contaminated, self-centered, manipulative, corrupted love. Because every one of us, you know tonight, if you love people, there's an element where you love people for what they can give you. A lot of people love people because it gives them a certain sense of importance or self-satisfaction. You can love people for completely wrong reasons. You have to bring your love to the cross and watch it die. You have to watch it die right there like Mary and all those women watch Jesus die on the cross. You have to watch your self-love die, your natural love die. But what's lovely is God's the God of resurrection. And he releases the love of God into your heart. It's not wonderful. It's not tremendous. So it's impossible. But with God, all things are possible. Let's look at the second wee thing that happens when your heart's enlarged. Look at Ephesians. Ephesians 3. If love's impossible, this is the end filling. Ephesians chapter 3. Sort of upstart me character, and they're, they're shouting out about love all the time. 
Love rules. There's no legislation on love. We know what love is. We want to pursue love. You know what I'm talking about? No? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know what I'm talking about. And it's normally some edgy, grumpy teenager or some student, and their hair's all in every direction, and they're saying, oh, we want to fight for love and love and love and love. And love. Right. Or maybe you meet the 16 or 17 or 18 year old, you meet them in church life, and they say, I love my boyfriend, I love my girlfriend, I'm going to do whatever I want to do. And what I find amazing is the amount of people that are self-confessed experts on the subject of love. I think it's the tragedy of the human race. Every one of us believes that we're experts when it comes to the subject of love. That when I fall in love, I know it's the right person. Or I know how to love people and all the rest. Do you know I was thinking about this recently? How preposterous it is for someone who's 25 years of age to say, I know what love's all about. Even for someone who's 50 years of age, even for someone who's 80 years of age, to say that I know what love's all about. Because when you put them beside God, who has loved for billions of years, has loved billions of people, has loved through every single circumstance of humanity possible, that was the God who created romance and marriage, the God who created Christian relationships, the God who created friendship, the God who's the mastermind of all of this, Every other boy should just put basically duct tape across their faces. Shut up, because I mean, you don't know anything about love. You don't know what it means. Who am I even in my experience of love to comment on it? This is why we have to turn to God, because God is the author of love. Now listen to this here in Ephesians 3. This is Paul's prayer for the Ephesian church. And it was a church that was maturing from teenage, basically, stages to fatherhood. This is what he's writing to them about. And this is what he reads, we read here in verse uh, 14, Ephesians 3 and verse 14. He says, For this reason I bow my knees to the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Essentially, I'm praying. That's what he means. From whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named. Tell me, how big is God's family tonight when you think of it? It's, it's, it's in its millions and millions. People in heaven, people on earth. He's, he's the God of, he's a father of a great family. It's incredible when you think about it. He's the father of such a family. And he knows every one of you. They tell the terrible story of um, the, the man who wrote Onward Christian Soldiers. You know about him? Onward Christian Soldiers and all the rest. He's a Victorian man. He had 11 children. And one day this wee child came up to him and said, uh, standing there and the, the man turned and says, well, What's, who's your daddy? And she burst into tears and says, you're my dad. <laughs> Eleven kids and he didn't know his own child. God doesn't suffer that with us. He has billions of kids in heaven and earth and he knows your name. He knows everything about you. Every hair in your head is numbered. He knows everything about your nature and family. It's wonderful. Verse 16 says, I pray that he would grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with might through his spirit in the inner man. In other words, that, that you're making more room for the Holy Spirit. Every one of us need to be praying this prayer. God, make more room for the Holy Spirit in my life. Make more room for the Holy Spirit inside of me. But look at this, 17. That Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, and that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the width and length and depth and height to know the love of Christ which passes knowledge that you may be filled with all of the fullness of God. What is Paul talking about? He's praying for these Christians. He says, what I'm praying is that God would strengthen your spiritual life so much. And what would happen is you get rooted into Christ, into knowing who he is. You're confident in him. You're rooted and grounded in him. And in this place of connection and trust in Jesus, God will reveal all of his love to you. And as God reveals his love, he will then fill you with that same love. And you will love with the love that God models. You will love with God's love, which is height, length, breadth, and depth. Someone says the love of God is so high it reaches into heaven. It is so low that it goes down to a man on his way to hell and picks him up out of it. It is so wide that it spreads over the whole world. And it is so long that it will go into eternity. The love of God is huge. It's absolutely huge, friend. And whenever you and I start asking God, God, reveal your love to me. Reveal your love. I don't want to just read John 3.16. 
I don't want to just read Bible passages about the love of God. I want to know this love. And if you look at it there in verse uh, 19, it's a love that surpasses intellectual knowledge. It's something you can't get your head around academically. I could give you books and books and says, read that there, and such and such a theologian wrote about the love of God, and it won't bring you into the experience. But whenever you get before God, and you spend time in His presence, and you say, God, I want to know your heart. I want to know your love. I want you to reveal your love to me. What God starts to do is He roots you into the ground. In other words, He gives you stability. Whenever the love of God starts to pour into your heart, do you know what happens? You're not shaken about by what people say about you. You're not shaken about by the man beside you or the woman beside you. There's a stability. You know where the roots are coming from. You know where the life is coming from. Your connection is with God and you know that's all that you need. It says you're grounded. There's a stability in your life as well. When the love of God fills your heart, boy, you get stable. But there's more than that. You can know the height. You can know the depth. You can know the length. You can know the breadth. You can know this love. <laughs> One way I like to think about it is this. There's four dimensions in this love and it's like being boxed in with the love of god it's like when you get into the prayer closet with god or a church or whatever you encounter god that his love becomes so real that it's like you're surrounded the, the room is forgotten the people are forgotten and the love of god is the only thing that's real to you and you just feel the love of god crashing on your soul you just feel god loves me so much he loves me he loves me he loves me so much and when you know that for yourself it's a game changer it's a game changer. Mm -hmm. I was thinking today of a couple of people in history that have encountered God's love in this way. Anybody heard of Blaise Pascal? Mm -hmm. yeah. Someone have heard of him. Anybody use a calculator or a mobile phone recently? The guy who lived in the 17th century was the man who first created the calculator, essentially. Brilliant phys physicist. But he was a man who lived in France. He was a Catholic man. But he had an awesome encounter with God and he was a saved character. And this is what happened to him on the 23rd of November, 1654, between half 10 at night and 12.30. And the reason people know about it was when he died, they found sewn into his coat a record and an account of what happened on that night. And this is, I'm reading just a part of it. He begins with one word and he says, fire. Fire. Half 10 at night in November, he says, fire. God of Abraham. God of Isaac, God of Jacob, not of the philosophers and of the learned. Certitude, certitude. He's been rooted and grounded. Rooted and grounded. Feeling, joy, peace. God of Jesus Christ, my God and your God, your God will be my God. That's only a wee section of it. But here was a man who was encountering the presence of God and he just says, it's like fire going through my body. It's like burning through me. And then the love of God is so real and so potent and so powerful. It's just shaping my whole character. It's so imprinting me and so impacting me that God is here. And here he is for two hours in the midnight hour encountering the love of God that's bringing certitude and assurance and stability and, and a grounding in God. And he's encountering the vast love of God. It's tremendous. Another man you haven't heard of is Frederick Lehman. Frederick Lehman. You wrote a very, very famous hymn, maybe some, some of you have sung it. Um, the love of God is greater far. Anybody sung that? Mm -hmm. right? The third stanza, this is where he writes, and this is a man who's encountered the love of God. Now get this into your mind. Could we with ink the ocean fill? And were the skies of parchment made? Were every stalk on earth a quill? And every man a scribe by trade? To write the love of God above would drain the oceans dry, <clears throat> nor could scroll contain the whole, though stretched from sky to sky. There's a man who's experienced the love of God and he says it's beyond knowledge. It's beyond any intelligent assessment or description. The love of God is huge. But what is tremendous, and when God reveals his love to your heart, it says this in verse 19. You are filled with all the fullness of God. He fills you. He fills you with the same love. So here's what I'm bringing to you. You can only love to the degree that God has revealed his love to you. In your own experience. 
Now you're called to love people, absolutely. But the only way that you're going to be filled is you get into intimacy with God. So what I'll say to you tonight is that if you're not having a regular time with God each day, scrap other stuff. Seriously. If you need to throw your phone through the window, do it. If you just say, look, I'm not going to have a big, big dinner tonight. I'll eat later on. I'm going to spend time with God when I get home from work. If you need to get up earlier in the morning, get alone with God. Because this is the only place that these verses come alive. It's the only place it happens. It's the only place this will take place. Let's just look at this last we thought. Last we thought tonight. To enlarge your heart, you have to realize, I can't do it myself. I have to die to my own affections. I have to ask God to come and reveal his love to me. And fill me with this love that, that makes my heart larger and larger. Anybody want to have an enlarged heart tonight? Are you prepared for what God's going to set you up? Because God has a wonderful, playful sense of humor. He loves to set us up good. <coughs> we talk sometimes here about a sneaky God. He's a sneaky God. He loves to do things like that there. If you are serious tonight about love and loving people more and loving people out of a fuller heart, this is the warning Jesus gives you in John 15. Look at John 15. This is our last verse here tonight. John 15, very familiar scripture where Jesus says, I am the vine, you are the branches. So what is he teaching? He's teaching Christianity is only possible in union and communion with me. You cannot live the Christian life out of principles or rules. You can't live it out of another person's experience. You can't live on a second-hand experience of God some other person has. You have to get into connection with Jesus and he is the vine supplies the life and the presence of the Spirit into your life and you start to love people out of that communion and connection with Jesus. Right? What Jesus says there, I'm going to break in in verse 8. He says this, By this my Father is glorified that you bear much fruit, so that you will be my disciples. But, I mean, what is the fruit that Jesus is talking about here? He goes on to say in verse 9, As the Father loved me, I also have loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love. Just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. These things have I spoken to you, that my joy may remain in you, and that your joy may be full. This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. And greater love is the man this than the man laid down his life for his friend. So Jesus is saying, I want you to bear the fruit of love. So as you're connected to me, the great lover, and you know me in an intimate, personal way, and you're getting deeper into my presence and deeper into the knowledge of who I am, the love will increase in you. The love will increase in you all the time. Doesn't that sound jolly good? <laughs> Lovely. Just, you know, cucumber sandwiches on the lawn with Jesus and cups of tea galore and everything possibly you could want. Ah, but I've skipped over verse 2. And this is the hard part. This is the bad news for all of you that want to increase in love. He says, every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes up. It literally doesn't mean that he destroys, by the way. Some people have that idea. It means that if, a, if the vine was, was drooping to the ground and the fruit was being lost, Jesus is coming to any one of you tonight that has been broken and offended and hurt by other people and your love has grown really, really cold. If you will come to Jesus tonight and forgive those persons who have hurt you, if you're willing to repent of sin that you may know of, Jesus will pick you up again and he'll tie you back onto the vine and you'll start to bear the love of God once more. But this is the bad news. Every branch in me that bears fruit so you're showing more love for Jesus. You're, you're increasing in love for other people. I mean, you're just a wonderful Christian. You love all these people so well. Isn't it marvelous God's working through your life? This is what Jesus says to those people. He prunes that it might bear more fruit. What do you typically prune a vine tree or any garden bush with? What do you normally prune it with? Sharp knife. Sharp knife. Secateurs, scissors. Do you know what those things are known as being? Cold, sharp, cutting instruments. Do you know when Jesus wants to increase loving you and you're serious about increasing in your love for Jesus? Do you know what Jesus will bring into your life? Cold, sharp, cutting people. They're obnoxious, horrible, nasty. 
nasty people that only Jesus could love. And even their mother may, on a certain days of the week, may have loved them. But not you. <laughs> and everything they say to you puts you down. And their face just looks like rotten custard. And they're just horrible. And you're just going through your swear book in your head for all the names you want to call them. But you're a Christian, so you can't call them all those nasty names. And you just want to tear them up into pieces and say, get out of my face. And yet Jesus, when you come to him and you pray and say, Lord, there's this guy working. He's such a pain in the whatever. And, and Lord, he's really getting on my nerves. And I'm really getting irate about this person. This girl is just such a nasty, catty lady. Why is this person sent in my life? And Jesus said, it's a gift. You can say thank you for it. He's pruning us. So here you are tonight, bouncy Christians, all excited to go further with God. You're saying, Lord, I know I can't love people in my own strength. And Lord, I know that you need to show me your love and fill me with your love. But don't leave this room bouncy tonight because what Jesus will do as a guarantee, according to John 15 and 2, he's going to bring the most difficult, awkward people and you're going to collapse under the pressure unless it's God's love flowing through you. He'll do that. He'll do that. I can remember where God taught me this lesson. God taught me this lesson when I was on a holiday with a bunch of other Christians. And we were 10 days. And I felt it was like Robinson Crusoe. And I said, boy, at least he had Friday to talk to or whatever, you know. I had these people, and I said, oh, these people are getting my nerves. Their dietary habits are different than mine. Their sleeping habits are different than mine. They're doing all of these difficult things. And Lord, they're, they're just getting right up my nose. These people are so difficult to get on with. I mean, they weren't speaking me up or anything, but it just was awkward and it was difficult. And you know what it's like when you do Christian holidays? <laughs> <laughs> Everybody laughs because they know. <laughs> one guy who sleeps in all the time and you want to go and see some place. And then there's another guy and he wants to go and look at all the museums. And I'm that guy, by the way. <laughs> so you don't take me on holiday. My wife knows. Honeymoon was interesting. We went through all the museums. Do we have to go to another one? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> The fact is this, God has a person set up for you and they're going to cut you, they're going to be cold, they're going to be sharp, but the end, end result is this, love is going to abound within you and you're going to love that person with God's help and you're going to increase in the love of God. And everybody says, we be. That's what's going to happen. You're going to get that. But that's the test. Because the test of love is what you deal and how you deal with difficult people. So for example, how are you going to cope in the morning when you're all stressed and you're running late to work and you've got paperwork up to here to get through in the morning and then that one obnoxious person comes to you at the tea break and has some snipe remark and you're just going to shoot back at them and give them both barrels? Or do you say, Lord Jesus, please help me now just to love that person as you love them? To see past what is evil, to see past what is wicked in them, and to see the image of God, to see that person as you see them and as valuable in your sight. And love. And that person turns around and he says, Why are you so nice to me? Why is it that you make me coffee when I've been so horrible to you? Why is it that you don't shoot back when other people, you know, I say these things when I get reactions out of Why don't you do that? <coughs> because his love is filling my heart to love him. That's what it's all about. So tonight, how big's your heart? How big's your heart? Do you, do you only love people that are helping you? Friends who are giving you the various things that you want? Do you love people that are just like you, the same race, the same age, the same gender, the same, I don't know, background or whatever? Do you, do you love people or can you love people that are different from you? Or indeed, have you a heart that's so large, he says, God, I love you with everything that I've got. And I'm loving the people that you're bringing into my life. And I'm loving even my enemies you're bringing before me. The heart can be shriveled or it can be enlarged. It can be shriveled or enlarged. This one last thing I'll say. See, when somebody gets married, when they bring the bride and the groom and they're, they're there at the front, and they look at each other and, and, and say their vows, When they turn to the girl and says, will you take this man to be your husband? Do you know what she says? If I feel it. If I feel like it, I love him. I'll be with him all my life. Is that true? No. No? No? Some marriages seem to be that way. They just did it on what they felt. 
And do you turn to the hubby and say, look, look, if you feel like loving her, or you feel like being with her, will you do it? No. In fact, the marriage vows go like this. Will you have this person? I will. What you have to realize tonight is although love is impossible, and it's only possible through God's unfilling, and you're going to get a real test of it as well, it's a decision to love people with God's help. That I will love you. Because friends, God didn't love you because he felt like it. God says in the Old Testament, I set my love on you. I chose you, I wanted you, and it wasn't because there was anything about you remotely special, it's because I chose to love you. I chose to love you. I chose you from the beginning of the world. I love you. That's the same love that works through our hearts tonight. So let's just close our eyes here, right? And if you spoke here this evening and you feel God is dealing with you and you feel your heart's too small, your heart's too small, let's just stand our feet if you feel you want to just ask God, let's enlarge my heart, Lord. That's an heart here tonight. I don't want a small wee heart any longer. I want a bigger heart. Bless you. So, Father in heaven, for those who have responded there tonight, we want to pray that, Lord, that you will just reveal your love in such a profound way in those people's lives right now. We pray the love of God to be shed abroad in their hearts and we ask you to enlarge their hearts now. Enlarge their hearts, Father. Lord, just let them lay down their natural love. Just let them lay it down at the cross, Father. And Lord, receive your love in return. And to love us, they ought to love by your power and your anointing. And so, precious Father, we just ask you now to, just to come and breathe in those areas and, and increase, Lord God, the power of your Holy Spirit within and we'll let them know that in their own lives. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. If anybody wants a wee bit of prayer tonight, uh, we'll get the front here. And look, if, if you feel like there's others getting prayer, just hold on tight. And we'll, we'll try to see you as all the same. And if anybody needs any help with any issue, uh, this can be dealt with confidentially. And if, even if you want the back room to be more quiet, that's all right. Don't worry about that. But let's just commit our time to the Lord and then the guys are going to uh, lead us in the final of our worship here. So Father, we just want to thank you that you're inviting us into the kingdom that is so full of the love of God. It's so full and so free. We just pray, Heavenly Father, now that even for all of us, Lord, here, God, we know that there's more. There's greater maturity in God. There's a greater place with you. And we ask you, Father, that you would draw us after yourself. And we would know what it is to be taken by the Spirit into a deeper relationship with you. We don't want to know about you. We want to know you. We don't want to have a second-hand experience where our dad or our mom or some person in the past encountered you and were hanging on their coattails. We want to know you personally and to know this height, length, breadth and depth type of love filling our hearts or healing our wounds, making us whole, making us strong, making us stable, making us to flourish. And Father, we pray now that you would just come and impart more of your love to those who are seeking that and reveal yourself in a greater way, Father. So God, see that everything that's of you tonight, anything that's, uh, Father, not of you, let it be forgotten. But everything that is of you, Father, let it be, Lord, remembered. And let it bear all of its fruit, now we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.